Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on the design process presented by Paul Collison. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter. Um, you can actually put, send in your questions throughout this whole presentation, which is a little bit different in style, and they'll be answering it throughout instead of saving it all at the end. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are all available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Paul Collison, the presenter for today's webinar. Paul has over 25 years of experience in various facets of lighting design, including multi-camera broadcasts, dance, opera, theater, fashion, large-scale public events, and video content creation, as well as video mapping and replay systems. Paul works extensively throughout the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. Assisting Paul today is Harmon's own Nathan Fleming, who will be doing a question and answer style interview with Paul. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Paul and Nathan. Great, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is just going to be uh, more of a conversation. So if you have any questions, as Laura said, just please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat box and we'll answer them as we go. Uh, you have my contact details on the screen. You're always welcome to get in touch with me if you want. Um, uh, and it'd be great to get some feedback on this presentation or other presentations you want to see that are timed more for uh, our region over here in Asia Pacific or uh, anything you want to see from Martin or from Harmon in general. Just feel free to reach out to me and connect that way. So uh, I think we'll just kick things off. And uh, so, Paul, I think uh, we should start at the beginning because that's a good place to start. A very uh, good place to start. I know. Uh, so I think what is interesting is how you get started on a design, especially for something large like a stadium show. What what do you, what sort of inspires you to start that design and how, how that process works? Right, the toughest question, and probably the longest question to answer first. Um, can you see Dale Martin sitting there? Hello, Dale. Just going to push you to the side. Um, look, I think that's a, it. Look, it's a really difficult question to ask because I think every project that you do follows a slightly different path. Uh, sometimes you get start. You have to start with the the form of the show, and by that I mean the the look and feel. Um, before you get into the function, and then other times you have to start with the function. Um, sometimes that's dictated to you, sometimes that's left up to you. Um, there are situations where you get presented an idea and your job is to come in as a designer and augment uh, the design, the aesthetic. Uh, and then there are other situations where you need to be the aesthetic. Uh, and I think, you know, both of those lead you down a different path and have a different uh, and have a very different approach. Um, so I thought I've got a couple of little pictures because I, I knew you're going to ask this question up first, and and I know this has got nothing to do with entertainment. Um, you can't see that pop up that's there, can you? No, cannot. Okay, great. No worries. So I'm just going to ignore it and pretend it's not there. Um, so this is obviously uh, a scene from Star Wars, and I thought it was interesting because I watched a, a doco on um, uh, the other day on YouTube uh, about the GOP, and all the sets had been designed for Star Wars, and the aesthetic was already established before he was brought in. And a lot of these sets were built in caverns, and there was no way to get light into them um, without you know, sticking lights on poles in front of sets. So it was actually the DOP that came up with the idea of doing all the cutouts that you can see in the back of the shots here. Uh, and they were, they were specifically inserted into the set so that, we could, so that he could get light into the space. Um, so in this situation, the, 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 the light sources become part of the aesthetic. So the, 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 the form of the set was already well established. Um, so I thought that was actually quite fascinating that the, one of the distinctive looks of this epic uh, movie 
uh, series was was came down to the fact that there was nowhere to put lights because otherwise these just would have all been hard surfaces in the design, um, okay. the set design. Now this is the show we uh, we just recently did on the Gold Coast uh, in uh, in Queensland, Australia. Uh, this is where Australia gets to choose their Eurovision representative. Um, and this is a situation where we could create a significant part of the aesthetic uh, from the beginning, so which we did with, with fixtures. So as you can see there, the, the, the great wall of, um, of sources there was the aesthetic, uh, and that was created in the lighting design. So we were the only thing that really existed to start with was, uh, and it's a little bit hard to see in these pictures, was the, uh, the kind of the deck of the Enterprise claw that, that, that sits around the stage there. Um, so it's, it's, it's really hard to answer the question, where do you get started? Because there are so many points and so many avenues to go down from that very first, hey, can you like this show? Yeah. No, that sounds fascinating. I think uh, one of the things we were talking about uh, when we came up with this idea was the, how do you balance the needs of, of the audience in the space and the camera? you know, in terms of aesthetic and how you light things and, and how does that, that kind of come together? Well, that, yeah, again, it's a good question. The, what, what's really interesting is that, you know, some time ago, probably pre-2007 and pre-smartphones, you were either doing a broadcast show or you were doing a live show. And there was a very distinct line between what you were doing. So if you were lighting for camera, you'd work out where your cameras are and that's what you're lighting for. And any audience that was around that were, we just refer to them as wallpaper. They really were background to what we were doing. But you fast forward to today and it's not, even in a, in a broadcast environment, it's not just what goes to air through your broadcast cameras, it's what goes to air through everybody's phones, iPhones, Samsungs, Androids, whatever, whatever they have. It's, it's what goes out on social media is sometimes deemed more important than what goes out on the broadcast cameras. So um, I find now, when, you know, I do, when I do a, a fashion show, for example, the client is as interested in how it looks on somebody's iPhone sitting halfway down the runway looking at a, a completely different aspect to the show than they are about the professional photographers who are um, taking the photos from the media pit where the show is orientated. So we tend to spend a significant amount of time trying to make the whole show look good. Um, but having said that, you know, you take going back to this uh, EAD show on the Gold Coast, for example, um, this is very much a broadcast show. So we are specifically lighting for the dozen or so cameras within the space. So every fixture, uh, every lighting device, whether it be a video screen or a luminaire, is placed to um, for the appeal of a camera. Um, and of course, there are two different types of, we'll probably get into this later, but there are two different things that you're doing here. One is you're creating this, hopefully, beautiful, beautiful aesthetic that creates excitement and drives the emotional narrative of a song. But we also need to see the performers. Um, so lighting the performers so that the camera can see them in the context of this epic landscape is equally as important. So keeping that balance uh, is just as important as um, looking at every other view. All right, I, I muted myself because there's hammer drilling going on in my apartment, <laughs> so I apologize for that in the background. Not at uh, all. Uh, so I think it'd be good to talk about like how do you get how do you work with color balance when you have so many fixtures that have aged differently and the lamps are all different and your sources end up, especially with, with reds, which tend to read very differently, you know, through the lens. How does that, how do you manage that with your, with your shows? That's a, that's an interesting question. And again, it does differ from show to show. Um, but I tend to start with the things that are less, um, that have that are, that are less malleable, I guess, than, than other things. So, uh, I've got another picture to look at here, so we don't all get bored looking at this. 
Uh, no, we'll come back to that and stay here for a second. So in this instance, the video screens probably have the least amount of control in terms of being able to color shift uh, to an incremental degree. Um, but we probably wouldn't start there. We actually tend to start with the key lights. I mean, the key lights are, are the lights that light the, the talent that we see on the screen. Um, that's the source that we would tend to try and balance to, uh, to colour balance to. And colour balance is very different, of course, to a level balance. Uh, and it's much easier these days with LED fixtures. Um, and I'm not saying this just because it's a Martin Harmon um, platform, but uh, the Encores are probably um, my favourite fixture currently for a key light um, because, uh, A, they're consistent. There is no drift, at, at least that we're currently aware of, in colour or intensity. Um, so we can pretty much rely on when we put 10 fixtures at 50%, they're all going to be an identical colour and they're all going to be an identical level. Um, so we'd probably pretty much start with those fixtures in terms of colour temperature. Uh, and we and I'd try and choose the native colour temperature of the fixture rather than shifting uh, the colour temperature of the fixture and then deal with the rest of the background to balance that out. Um, but the screens uh, are important if you're in a projection world. Again, projection screens are, are less controllable to a, to a greater degree uh, in terms of colour temperature manipulation. So you, you might start there. If there's daylight coming into part of your image, then you might be dictated to a higher colour temperature because daylight's forming a significant source of your picture. So I tend to look at the things that are uncontrollable uh, in terms of that's the base light level or colour temperature and then work around that. Okay. And uh, how do you, when you're looking at like a, a new fixture or something that's just come on the market, how do you, how do you evaluate that? Do you look at spec sheets? Do you look at CM30, CRI data? Like what, what kind of draws your eye when you're looking, looking for something new to add to a show? <laughs> That would actually probably be an easier question to answer again 10 years ago when we had spots and we had washers and you know you could you could pretty much balance between them but now we've got beam lights we've got you know you look at some of the fixtures the companies like Ayrton are putting out now that that are you know bordering on are they actually lights are they video screens are they um, you know they're, they're they're really pushing the envelope and, and a lot of companies are pushing the envelope as to what's actually deemed a light source now and what is uh, you know, eye candies uh, in the background. So, um, but specifically lights in general, I think you definitely look at spec sheets. You, you look at the sheets and you, you run the numbers and you, you know, sometimes, most of the times you're looking at a situation at a, at a new fixture, it's because you have the opportunity to, uh, to take advantage of the new features and that might be greater intensity, uh, switching to an LED source instead of a discharge source. Um, so you're looking at the new fixture um, with, it, with the optimism of using it, uh, but those, those specs become important, but only up until you can get the fixture in your hands, and I think there's no substitute for getting, getting a fixture in your hand and pointing it at something and seeing it with your eye, because you can sit there with a meter and the meter can be telling you the, that the intensity is perfect and the colour balance is perfect, but if your eye is telling you it's not, um, that's the thing I'll go with every time. Um, so, you know, sheets and specifications are important. It's hard sometimes to correlate those fixtures between manufacturers because there are slightly different um, tolerances in some of those specifications. So. You know, in my opinion, I think there's no short, there's no substitute to getting an actual light in your hands and testing it, whether it be with other fixtures or just on its own, but actually seeing it, touching it, feeling it. Um, that's, that's the most important thing to me. Okay. Um, and then uh, I think the other question I have, especially for broadcast, is uh, is on uh, PWM. Like, do you have a, a refresh rate that you kind of follow as your as your standard for, for all your lights or is there, you know, do you try to go with the highest rating or with the lowest or, or how does that, how do you program that in? Well, that, that, that's a slightly tougher question to answer because the, 
it will greatly depend on what cameras you're using. You know, are you using straight ahead broadcast cameras? Are you using, um, you know, you might be in a film clip situation where people start using DSLRs and shooting on strange frame rates. Um, every, you know, a lot of those situations differ and sometimes a higher refresh rate might not necessarily be your best friend. Um, it might cause more trouble than sitting at a lower refresh rate. Um, you know, working in a in a in a sports environment where they're using super slow mo cameras, um, it becomes really important to try and understand how many frames per second the camera is shooting and how what the refresh rate of the fixture is, uh, and determining whether you're going to have any trouble. And sometimes, again, the specs might tell you that it's going to be fine and okay, but until you get it in a real life situation with the light illuminating something from a super slow mo camera shooting it, you won't actually know that you've got an issue. Um, sometimes that can be fixed in the fixture. You know, some some fixtures have uh, selectable refresh rates that you can choose. Sometimes it's fixable in the camera. Uh, sometimes if you fix it for your lighting fittings, you then develop a problem with the screens. Um, so yeah. there are now, you know, there are now multiple um, areas in which you need to solve the problem. Yeah. Do you see gen locking as a as a way to solve that? Like if you could gen lock all your fixtures and all your screens together with the cameras or Well, that would be cool. That would be very cool. Whether that's possible or not, I think <laughs> remains to be seen. I think I'd hate to run all that cable. Um but you know maybe electronically there, there is a way to do that. I mean of course that would definitely fix fix the problem or go uh, somewhat down the path of being able to fix that problem. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest problems we have are in situations where we're shooting on cinematic cameras or, you know, cameras that aren't necessarily straight ahead broadcast cameras uh, and things like DSLRs and shooting at strange refresh rates. Um, yeah. In fact, the, the, the biggest trouble I've had has been in a stills photography fashion environment. Um, in fact, where's my? I do have a. Where's that picture? I've got a picture here where um, I don't know if this translates very well here, but this is a uh, Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week in Sydney that we do each year. Except for this year, uh, in fact, it's the last day of Fashion Week today, or it would have been. Um, uh, so this is the same model on the same set on the same day, uh, and we've got one photographer on the left that is seeing a red shift uh, in the shadows and on the right hand side we're not seeing that. It's a different photographer. Same brand camera, different lens, different shutter settings, different settings within the camera. Uh, but you've got one photographer who is seeing uh, a shift in colour and another one who isn't. So, you know, these situations are, are tough as well because same light source, everything is the same except for the photographers. Uh, and trying to, you know, trying to get to the bottom of how we fix that. Is that a problem with lighting or is that a problem with the photographer? And how do you communicate that without making the photographer yeah. feel like he's not doing his job properly? Um, yeah. You know, this isn't necessarily a general uh, specific thing like your question, but uh, it's still a challenge, particularly with LED fixtures um, that we're seeing. And this, is, and this is a refresh rate issue. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So uh, the first one is, um, what is gen locking a fixture? Do you want to field that or do you want me to answer that? You know what? I think I'm, I'm more happy for you to answer it if you like. Oh, okay. Or, or gen uh, lock? I mean, gen, the, gen, lock, the it, gen lock question. Uh, well, it's, it's basically um, locking the camera frame rate together with the uh, with the frame rate of the lighting so that the camera and the lighting are aligned on that. So it's kind of a, it's like a world clock in sound where everything knows, everything gets a certain information that tells it um, where it is in time and then it can align together so that all your refresh rates kind of line up. So if you, um, a good example of this is if you see those videos on YouTube where you see the helicopter flying, but the rotor is static. So that's when you have your frame rate align with the the travel of the rotor so it looks like the rotor is holding still but it's actually moving very quickly to lift the helicopter off the ground so that's kind of the problem 
like why you would want to genlock that together. Although I don't know how you would genlock a helicopter to a camera. Um, <laughs> You'd want a long cable. Um, oh yeah, no, I, yeah. It's it's a heartbeat that that keeps everything um, locked and synchronized together, and it's it's specifically a broadcast, and we definitely do it um, in a in a broadcast environment where you want to make sure all the camera um, frame rates are all synced and locked together and any sort of screens or projection are all uh, refreshing at the same time uh, so that you're not seeing something half refreshed when the camera takes a, a snapshot. Yeah, and uh, the other question is, uh, with so many angles to cover in key light, uh, not just broadcast cameras, but also red cameras, everyone's mobile phone, and then just live audience, uh, do you find that it's becoming more difficult to cover all angles with just fixed key lights? Yeah, yes and no, and, and this, um, you, you know, you can't be all things to all people. Um, you, we, we generally try and establish some rules, uh, first and foremost, and, um, you know, not having somebody perfectly lit all the time is, uh, is, is okay, because that's natural, and I think, you know, the, the rules of broadcast have changed and broadened quite considerably um, you know, I would say in the last 20 years, you know, if somebody had a shadow on their face 20 years ago, you'd be sacked. Um, but now we're much more forgiving of uh, and, and almost desiring uh, shadows and uh, it, when it's required, you know, to add some mystery, to add some, uh, add some excitement to a picture. Um, but you also have to prioritise who's important in that regard. So if someone's taking a picture on their iPhone in the audience, it needs to look good, but if it's going to sacrifice the pictures that are going to live on uh, from your broadcast, then you, know, you, need, you need to balance those things out and weigh them up. Um, you know, you'll never really successfully like for red cameras and broadcast cameras at the same time because red cameras just requires so much light uh, to work properly that in the instances where I've, I've ended up, uh, where I've done shoots where we're trying to do both, we've had the luxury of not doing it live and being able to do a pass of the broadcast cameras and then we do a, another take of the song with red cameras uh, and trying to push more light into our scene so the red cameras can deal with it. But absolutely, it's a huge challenge. And you know, with experience you start to understand, you know, everyone's going to complain and with experience, you start to understand, well, I, your point's valid and I'm listening to you, and your point's valid but I'm not listening to you. Your point's valid and yes, I will half fix your problem and just trying to balance. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's a careful balance. Yeah. So, um, let's see, where are we? Uh, what, for, for the large shows, for like stadium sized shows, like what's, what are the biggest challenges and how uh, how do you go about managing a team of that size? Because obviously you have technicians all the way up to your programmers and and a few different locations to manage at the same time that are all part of the, the overall kind of picture that people are seeing. Yeah, look, managing the team, it's funny. I mean, being a, I used to think being a lighting designer just meant that you had to make stuff look cool. And you know, and see something, and all of a sudden now I find myself at this point in my career. I'm part psychologist, part nutritionist, part travel coordinator, <laughs> and you know, and lighting has become this incremental thing that I do on the side while I'm trying to keep um, a greater team, not necessarily happy, but but focused on what they're doing. Um, you know, when you when you're working on a on a on a uh, a large project, and um, you know, maybe. I, where we were with, with this EAD project. We have, we've got a big team that works on this show. We make the video content. Um, you know, we provide all of the uh, front of house operators, the media server operators, key line operator, um, the moving light operator. There, there are, what are there? there are five or six of us at front of house just, just running the show, plus another um, half dozen full time uh, systems techs just making the lighting rig work. Um, so coordinating all those people and keeping them engaged and focused on their role is is definitely a huge part of, of what I do now. Um, and fending off interference, I call it sometimes. So you know when a when a um, 
a, you know, a producer or, or an artist wants to, to talk about their particular song or their feel, I try and extricate myself from the front of house position so that we can go and discuss those things while the team um, behind the consoles can keep updating, keep fixing problems and keep moving forward. Um, so that, that certainly, um, you know, running interference for those people sometimes is, is just as important as, uh, as driving them and, and, and working with them. Um, but when, you know, when it comes to operators, I'm also, uh, and programmers, I'm a, I'm a bigger believer in less is more. I've worked in situations where we've had, you know, four or five different programmers, but then if there's only one designer, then that designer really only has time to work with one uh, programmer at any given time. So I would rather have a smaller team uh, that works harder than try and go to a bigger team that inevitably means people are sitting around waiting for somebody else to finish before they can continue their job. Are you still muted? Oh, uh, <laughs> terrible. Sorry, there's just, right. just a hammer drill in the back. I just don't want to have it come through. Uh, no. Okay, we're counting here. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I can hear it. It's really loud. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on like the convergence of lighting and video as disciplines? Like, how does how are those coming together in the in an application? Uh, how are they coming together? I think you got the wrong tense. I think you know they've come together. Um, yeah. And it, 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 they've definitely come together. I just if I've got a picture of Stephen. Oh, it's not going um, you know, they've, they've, they've definitely come together. I mean, video and lighting is one in the same. You know, the, the, at the end of the day, a video screen, particularly in a, in, a, in a broadcast studio sense, the LED surfaces are the biggest lighting fixture in the studio. Um, so it, it, it makes sense that the lighting department needs to be in control of that fixture. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm advocating for lighting technicians to become video technicians. I just think at a design um, and control perspective that it, it that that has and, and should be unified um, from a central source because there's no point in having, you know, somebody caught up in what happens in the rectangle over here and that is completely disassociated with the overall aesthetic. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, you know, I. I'm trying to think back. The first time I actually controlled video with lights, I think, was 2001. So you know, we're, we're 20 years down the track of of, of this being a thing. Um, and in some instances, you know, I still drag producers kicking and screaming into the world of the lighting department want to control it, all the all the video as well. And then in others, it uh, it's just a given that, that that's what we do. Um, you know, my company has stemmed from a lighting design company and now we do a significant amount of uh, motion graphic content creation. And, not, and that all started out of self-defense because we didn't like being in situations where we had an idea of how a song would look or a performance would look and then somebody turns up with the video content and that's completely at odds with what we were trying to do. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I think understanding that the, the video screens are a light source in themselves. So, you know, if they are bright white, they are going to wash things out or it will change the overall look. And if you have a bit of content that's going from uh, a high whites to dark blacks and back and forth again, the, the luminosity in the space is going to change considerably. So, yeah, we, you know, I, I, it's really yeah. important for, for me that, you know, when, whenever we can, we, uh, uh, we're we're in as much control of the video as possible. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and sorry, I was just going to say the only reason I brought this picture up was, uh, you know, this was a this was a, an opening ceremony for the the women's T20 World Cup uh, that we did uh, just in January. It's hard to imagine we actually did shows this year. Um, and this this is an instance where we had uh, where we've got lighting fixtures everywhere, but we're we're driving video through it all. And so we've made snippets of video content to, to loop in and work through the lighting rig. Uh, you know, and this isn't revolutionary. This is stuff we do all the time. So uh, even though I was employed and my title was lighting designer, 
uh, I'd say 90% of the cues we ran on the show were video cues. Okay, nice. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? We've had two questions. If there's anybody with a question, uh, just feel free to type it in and then I'll, uh, we can answer them. Uh, what I, I think something I'm interested in is what sort of compromises do you have to make uh, on these bigger shows or, you know, even on smaller shows, like you come in with a design and you, you know, maybe the right fixture isn't there or, or you have a challenge that you, you weren't expecting, like what, what are the biggest challenges and how do you, how do you work around them? I think at some point, and hopefully it's early on in your career, you realize that everything's a compromise. Um, there is no utopia of, I can use whatever fixture I want on this show. And it doesn't matter, you know, it, it, I'm sure it happens, uh, you know, when Lady Gaga or the Rolling Stones go out, and they're going to do a 24 month tour and, um, you know, Leroy can come out and go, oh, I just, these are the fixtures I want, I don't care. Um, because the, the tour is going to pay for those fixtures. So, but those situations are very few and far between. You can't dictate all of your fixtures all the time. So, uh, and, and, you know, not only is everything a compromise, but you also need to pick your battles. And, and hopefully that's something that we do reasonably well. Because if you fight for the fixtures you must have or need and let those other ones go. And so quite often for me, you know, I've got a good relationship with the several production companies that I work with locally here in Australia and hopefully farther afield it's the same where uh, we'll, we'll create a list of, I must say, you know, We've got these hundred fixtures for this show, uh, and then then the negotiation begins because you're always fighting budget versus uh, amount of lights. And I know that if I go to production company A um, and they own all of those lights, I'm going to get a better deal than if I go to production company B and they have to sub hire them in uh, or cross hire them in. So uh, often I'll find that that the the company that that we're going to work with is already established as we're creating a, a lighting spec. Um, and then it just becomes a matter of what's important and what can I easily substitute. And for me, excuse me, um, for me it's obviously key lights are, are the deal breakers. They, they have to be a specific type uh, because you just can't afford to compromise when it comes to lighting somebody's face, you know, or lighting an artwork or, you know, when you're actually illuminating something, they are the most important light sources. If we're talking about doing 100 beams in here at the back of the stage, well, you know, I can I could probably list off a dozen different fixtures that would do that job right now. Um, so they become much more negotiable. Uh, but then, you know, once you start talking about, well, is it a bar or is it a block or is it a is it one of these bespoke fixtures that are coming out? Um, you know, do does it have to be that, or can it be flexible? I think the the the, the big the big thing for me is, is is picking your battles and fighting for the fixtures that you just that you know will improve the product, and then being more flexible on the rest of the system. Okay, nice. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, what what do you suggest for like a recent graduate from uh, one of the art schools, like how do they gain experience to get, get into lighting design? Oh, geez, that's tough. It kind of depends on where you are. And I don't know if there's a tried and true formula. Um, it's a, it, yeah, it, what, where did that question come from, may I ask? Is it? Uh, I think Australia, South Australia. Yeah, okay. Look, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I oh, Sydney, I'm going. wrong. It's Sydney. Sydney. Oh, there you go. Sydney, I I mean, look, I would, it, actually, it really doesn't matter. I mean, usually I would say just get in and go do as many shows as you can and volunteer your time, but there are no shows at the moment that make it a little bit hard. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very tough market to break into, and it seems to be getting tougher. Um, even though you may have graduated from a, from a well-respected institution, um, the, the hard part is getting out there and making yourself, make your presence felt in the market. 
Um, nobody's going to give you a show straight up, uh, you know, a, a corporate show or, 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 or a big show. Um, you need to get runs on the board. So that could mean anything from working at the local RSL club to going to uh, a venue and working at a venue and rigging lights. And, and you know, I've, I've often said it, it, the people that come out of some of those institutions, you almost need to spend the next 12 months unteaching them everything they've learned um, and reformatting it in a way that suits, I don't want to say the real world, but I'm going to say the real world because it's, um, because it's true. Because life, our profession can't be compartmentalised into a box and this is the formula. Um, there is no formula. Every designer I know has come through um, the ranks in a different way. Some have studied and spent time in the theatre and then emerged as a designer out of the theatre. Some have run around television shows, plugging things in and watching and learning to a, until they get to a point where the head of the studio says, oh, okay, we well, can do this small show at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And then all of a sudden you get the 9 a.m. show on a Sunday morning before you graduate to doing the primetime shows. Um, so I don't know if this is being helpful at all. But I think in, in, the essence, in essence is, is just get out there and be prepared to do anything. I've loaded trucks, I've driven overnight, I've done um, red-eye flights across the country to get from job to job, um, you know, all in the interest of learning um, and all in the interest of uh, getting out there. And so um, the, the more you see, the more you volunteer, the more you work in any capacity, gains you experience, opens you up to more people, and then once uh, once your peers start to recognise you as, some, as somebody who can contribute to a group to deliver a show, um, you know that's that's the step, isn't it? I guess is, is getting to a point yeah. where you can contribute and your contribution is valued and deemed valued by a greater group. Did that yeah. help? What was your uh, like? I was rambling. Yeah. What was your, what was your first like your first big gig like what was your your big break, from doing the Ooh. driving trucks and flying red eyes and like, what would you say is the moment that you were like I am a lighting designer and I am I'm on my way. That's interesting. I'm just going to change the picture because I can. Um, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It's it, it's a little it's not embarrassing because it was a pretty defining moment. I remember I just done a follow spot call at. Panthers Leagues Club out west and it was like an hour and a half drive back home and it was the middle of the night and um, I, I was working for a production company. I was, I was carrying gear up and down stairs. I would go into the factory on a Sunday afternoon and pull down a console and um, learn how to make a light move from one side of the room to the other. You know, that, that's, that's the stage of the career that I was, I was at and I, you know, I was doing follows but I was doing whatever I could. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be a designer and I knew that I wanted to program and get my console. And anyway, the, the phone rang and it was a, it was a, a colleague of, well, it was, a, it was the owner of the production company actually, he'd rung and said, um, there's a tour out, it was Slim Dusty, um, there's a tour out and they've rolled the truck and the guys are okay, but the lighting guy won't be able to continue the tour and they want somebody to go out to the back of Burke tomorrow um, to light this tour. And I was like, me? Really? Like, is everybody else busy? Uh, and his answer was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you do it. And, uh, <laughs> well, well, look, you know, even if I was the last person on the list, at least I was on the list. Um, and so I remember, yeah, next morning, you know, I had to cancel a few things, move a few things around. But yeah, jumped in the car the next day and drove three hours out west into the middle of the country and um, for anybody outside of Australia who doesn't know who Slim Dusty is, he is um, he is one of the biggest country music stars in in the country, or he was until he passed uh, ten years ago or so. Um, and so, not only was it my first tour, but it was like this legend of, of music in Australia. Um, and I, I still I still remember one night we were out in the middle of nowhere, and we were having a barbecue on our one and only night off on that tour. And there I was sitting with Slim Dusty and his wife and his daughter and, and a couple of other people and thinking to myself, stars for days because we were out in the country, thinking, wow, this is actually really, really cool. Um, 
so yeah, I think that is probably that was probably one of the the, the moments really early on where I thought this this could actually be something. Right. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm just looking at the questions. Uh, whether it's uh, mentally or practically, how do you manage shows? Everything that can go wrong is going wrong. <laughs> oh wow. Well. Um, ah, well, that's yeah. Look, I have days like that all the time where I, you know, wake up and the alarm's not working, and my email stopped, and my computer's decided not to boot up, and then you get to the show, and all of a sudden someone's lost the show file. You know, I think the 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 one thing that hopefully I I do is not panic, and I know that's a that sounds a little stupid, and and telling somebody who's panicking not to panic is like pouring oil on the fire, but there's always a way out. Uh, and it might not be the best way, but there's always a way out. Um, so, you know, if, if it's all falling apart, sometimes you just go take a breath, even walk outside the venue, go and take two minutes to yourself to take a breath and then prioritise what's important. What 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 can I do to fix the problem? I had an instance a long time ago now where I was doing a corporate show in a hotel in Sydney and I had a, had a I think it was a hog too. And I was doing the dutiful thing and saving up to two discs and everything was fine. And then the um, guy on the floor said, all right, you know, ready to open doors, is everyone ready? I like, oh, hang on one sec, I just need to save the show file. So I saved the show file to the two discs and as the second save finished, the console turned off. Oh, that's weird. Reset it, turn the console off, I'm back on, and my show file had disappeared. Ah, I'm smart, I've got two copies of this. So I put the first disc in, didn't work, and now my hand's starting to shake. And put the second disc in and load, and now my hand's starting to shake, and um, that didn't load either. So now my whole body is shaking, and I've got this maitre d' on the floor going, Come on, we're opening the doors now. And I'm freaking out at this stage. And I, I look over and there's a, a, a disc that I hadn't saved to that had come with the console that had the patch on it. So I loaded that. Unfortunately, that worked and I had the patch. That was it. Not one cue was loaded in this show. So I panicked, of course. <laughs> um, but at that point, I, I said to myself in mid panic, okay, what's important? Audience are walking in. I need an audience look. So grab a light, put them up in blue, whatever, because store, done. Open doors. So now the audience are coming in and I'm slowly grabbing different fixtures and trying to do a bit of a stage wash and just trying to literally building the show as it flowed that night. Um, and somehow got through it. Um, which was disappointing in some ways because nobody noticed that I hadn't programmed anything and I was doing the whole night completely on the fly. Um, but nice to know that, you know, that at, up until that point, that was probably one of the worst things that could have happened to me in my career. But it just take a breath, what's important, step by step, go through and see what you can do. Cool. Uh, what console do you recommend uh, for people to learn on? Like if somebody's starting to learn a console, are you, do you think it's MA? Is it? Never uh, That is a really. I mean, look, I. I don't. Do I have to? I. I guess I. I I'm very close to to MA. Um. But you know that's that's the that's the control platform that I've completely invested myself in. I don't have enough brain capacity to learn multiple platforms. Um. And I guess I'm in a fortunate situation where I don't have to use anything else. I can dictate what I use. Um, or, or what's used on the shows that I'm that I'm designing on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the email platform is incredibly popular in the musical theatre market and in the theatre market in general, um, but not so anywhere else. So I guess you know if you were wanting to focus on that particular market, then you 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 must you must learn um, the ETC consoles. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's, that's, that's a tough question because I will always say MA because of my yeah. personal opinion. 
But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter, asterisk, um, as long as you know how to use it. And that's the most important thing. Um, and if you decide to invest in overlights emotionally and with your, with, with your brain, then you've just got to make sure that that's something that you can get everywhere. And I think that's the key, is finding a platform that you either take with you or you can hire locally. Um, because I've seen way too many people who, you know, Avalites aren't incredibly popular in this country, and so when somebody from overseas comes over um, to use to, to use those consoles, um, there isn't a lot of local knowledge. So if the person coming over doesn't know how to use it backwards, we end up with this terrible gulf of the, the production company or the venue saying, here's your console, we don't know how to use it, and a person going, well, I don't know how to patch it, I only know how to push the flash button. Um, so, you know, whatever it is that you, you decide to use, just learn how to use it well and make sure that it's a platform that is popular everywhere. The great thing about almost every platform, I believe, is that you can at least get a version that you can use on a computer and you don't need the hardware to learn how to navigate the software. I think it's impossible to learn a console without having lights or without doing an actual job. Um, but at least having the ability to access tools offline um, is important. So I think that would be a major deciding factor to to make sure that um, yeah you had the ability to push buttons virtually. Um, how how has pre visualization changed the way you program shows? And uh, is it? Does that make your job easier to communicate with creatives? And my other question following this would be, how do you manage expectations between your visualization that is perfect and the reality that is not so perfect? You hit the nail on the head. As soon as anybody mentions the V word to me, I have to stop and say, right, there are two types of visualization. There's the type that's useful for me as a designer and useful for the programmers that I work with. And there's the type that makes pretty pictures for you to stick on the wall or for you to show your client. Um, and they are very different. There is no middle ground to create pretty pictures that are useful for us or thing, you know, or vice versa. Um, and, and I make sure I'm, I try and make that expressly clear with, with my clients because, um, there, there is no such thing as the perfect visualizer doesn't exist. The only perfect visualizer is here. Um, uh, well, actually in here. Um, so when you start using a visualizer and you are looking at the screen and you can't identify what's going on, but when you look at the console and you, and you program that you know in your head how it's going to look. Visualizers are great for doing positions, making sure that the, the, um, the, the blocks of work that you're achieving are done. Um, and getting you in a great position for the live experience. Um, but the, in the, inevitably, if you've done it that way, the pictures aren't going to be great. And if you start making changes to the programming to make the pictures look cool, then you're undoing the programming and what you expected is not going to be what you see when you actually plug into real life. Um, so visualizers are great for learning. Great for pre-programming, um, but as long as you don't rely on uh, the visualizer being an accurate representation of how things are going to look, draw on your experience and draw on um, your knowledge of what the console is telling you, not what the visualizer is telling you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think that's that's quite interesting. Um, because you see the visualizers and then you see the, the the renders all the time and it's always very different. So that's cool. Oh. Um, well, it is. It is. And you know, and the latest fad is grabbing a cool picture of your show and then bringing the visualizer in next to it. And you know, they're getting better. I've got to say that there, there are some phenomenal visualizer packages out there uh, right now. But it's there, there still comes a point where you just need to make a mental note that. No, the work I'm doing on my console is right, and I'll make those changes when I see the actual lights. Yep. Um, kind of smashing a couple of different questions together. Um, 
do you ever find that you get you start nerding out and then you end up having something that's technologically cool and you just focus on that and it just sucks all of your energy in because you're like, wow, this is really neat, but it doesn't really do much for the show. Yeah, definitely in years gone by and times gone by, yes. Um, but that is something that, you know, again, it was like this little light bulb that went off in my head one day. I was like, yeah, that's really cool that I've got this macro that triggers this, that makes a mouse run around on the wall and dumps a ball and it comes down and pushes the go button. But I'm the only person that sees that. Um, you know, it's a, you, I do it all the time. I all, uh, and sorry, no, all the time I ask myself that question. Is this, is this effect cool because I've just learned a new way of writing an effect? Or is it cool because it's cool? Um, and you know, in the last you know two or three years, I've really started to step back from programming myself and trying to be a real designer, and um, and just look just just look at the pictures. Um, and that helps in a, in a lot of ways because I often found when I was sitting behind console, I would look down and do some work and then look up for the next thing. Um, so there were great periods where you weren't actually paying attention to your end product. Um, so, you know, so, and you could get caught up with, oh, this is cool because I'm triggering this and that's doing that and that's good. I'm going to change the colour of this and the way this is labelled. And then you look up and it looked the way it did 10 minutes ago. You've just made a more complex way of doing it. Um, you know, or, or you're mapping video to something. Lots of people get excited about mapping video to this, mapping video to that. Um, but I honestly believe if you've got a good effects engine that maybe 80% of the time you'll get a better result out of the effects engine than you will mapping video to something. Um, and the audience don't know the difference between a, a, an effect from a console or a video map. Um, they just know what looks cool. So yeah, it's, 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 it's something that I think as a designer and a programmer you need to ask yourself quite often. Is this cool? or and you know, do I think it's cool because it's complicated? Um, when you come up against a creative block in a design, do you go back? Like, what do you go back to? Do you go back to the rigging plot, like where you can put your trusses to see, you know, where you could put the lights, or is there is there a, a way you get through those blocks where you're not sure what to do? I just procrastinate. I'm the greatest <laughs> procrastinator there it is. I just, I, if, if, if I hit a roadblock, I'll go and watch a movie or I'll go for a walk or I'll, I've got a, an electronic drum kit in my office where I'll go and sit on that and um, play drums, not as well as I used to, but play drums, you know, for half an hour. Um, and then I'll procrastinate some more. I, I spend a lot of time thinking and less time doing. Um, and I and 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 I do that, and and that's that works for me. I don't know why, but it just does. You know, like I've got a plan that's due on Friday. You know, my my mantra is why do today what you can put off till tomorrow. You know, like I would rather I would rather think about that plan for three days and then stay up until four o'clock in the morning drawing it based on my three days of churning it over in my head. What am I going to do? Maybe I'll move that over there. Maybe I won't. You know, I just, it, something hits me and it's like, great, now's the time to do that. Unfortunately, it might be dinner time and I'm supposed to be cooking for the family or I'm supposed to be going to a meeting, but the, the, I, I, I have to wait for that moment where my mind and my body says, oh, that's what we're doing. And I'll just dive headlong into it and I'll look up and it'll be four o'clock in the morning, but I've drawn what it was that I've been thinking about for two weeks. Um, Sometimes that's not possible, you know. I'm, I'm sure the person that asked the question kind of meant, "How do I fix it now?" Um, yeah. But you know, coffee fixes everything. Um, so you know, if it, I tend to, you know, go and make a coffee if I get stuck. Uh, but I think removing yourself from the situation and coming back to it is the only thing to do. You know, I can't stare at computers unless I'm lost in what I'm doing. I can't force myself to do something. I have to work up to it. Um, so, you know, I might go and make a coffee and you know, sit outside and look at the trees and think about the birds and then my mind will drift back to what I was supposed to be doing and then I'll, um, I'll start going again. But everybody's different. 
I don't know, I think you just need to search for that one thing that makes you um, tick and yeah, yeah, use that. Nice. Uh, do you have a, a favorite like show you've done or biggest accomplishment? Like, oh, I think everything. You know, what, someone asked me that the other day. I think my biggest accomplishment was just still being here. Um, I oh, look there. You know, there are, there are so many. You know, we do. I mean, this this show on on screen here, World's Got Talent, that we did last year, was a show that just shouldn't have looked as good as it looked and it was only due to the tenacity of, of, of you know, our, our team of designers and it was me in conjunction with you Noah know, from Full Flood uh, and some programmers from the US and some programmers from Australia that managed to pull this off. Um, you know, so that was a win in others. You know, I love the, the ECAD show that we do in uh, on the Gold Coast uh, each year. It's, you know, it's such a great group of people uh, and really enjoyable. Um, probably, I don't think I've got a picture of it actually. The show that I, um, the show that I probably am most proud of though is the show that we did in 2006, I know that was a long time ago, where we had, and it was a stadium show, we had 42 days from the client saying, um, let's do the show to delivering it. It was in a stadium in Abu Dhabi. Um, and it was just one of those situations where we had a great group of people sat around and said, right, can we do this? And somebody would say, yeah, we can do that. I reckon we could stick a big thing out on the field and people can paint it live and do that. Great, we'll do that. Can we fly somebody in? And the engineers go, and, and within two minutes would say, yes or no. And so there was this really right. proactive, pragmatic situation where people, where, where the team just gelled and managed to deliver this world-class stadium show in 42 days, including bumping and rehearsals and whatnot, um, you know, and in an environment in the country that didn't necessarily have all the infrastructure that we needed. So, um, you know, there are those things that you look back on and think, wow, you know, I was quite proud of that. Um, but, you know, one of my, the favourite show thing, you know, there, there are lots of them, um, but what I, my favourite shows now are the, are the shows with good people. You know, we spend so much time in our industry getting to the end result and working to for that applause or for that moment of the show, um, that you can't always live for that moment. The journey has to be pleasant as well. So if that journey is not with good not with good people, with good intentions, is fun um, and interesting, then it, it's kind of not worth it for me now. You know, like I, I'm much more focused on the journey and the end result, whereas you know, a, a while ago I was probably more focused on the end result. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't want to work hard. I, I love working hard, but I just I want it to be with good people and I want experience to be good. And I think if there's anything that I would um, try and profess to anybody, that would be enjoy the journey or take note of the journey as much as the final destination. Okay. Oh, that's great. Uh, Laura, do we still have time, or what's your, or are you? <laughs> I mean, there's not a buzzer that's gonna go off. It's, it's kind of <laughs> <a change. laughs> I I don't know. I was just I I saw that we'd hit uh, an hour, but we can uh, maybe do a couple more questions and then we'll. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Finish if you if you're good for a couple more minutes, Paul. I'll stop trying to ramble too. Great. Oh, no, rambling is good. <laughs> Um, with uh, large-scale lighting festivals, how do you balance uh, eye candy and uh, ambient lighting and, and key lighting? Right. Wow, that's a good question. Well, it, I mean, the thing with the ambient lighting in those situations is that the ambient lighting is your is the one thing you generally wouldn't have control of. So that defines your base light level. So whatever you do fixture-wise over the top of that, it's got to be brighter or has to penetrate that base light level. Um, and your key lights either need to augment that base light level or completely go over the top of it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's in, with those three things that you listed off, the only one that you have no control over is the ambient light. So um, 
that's what that's what dictates things. Um, if people are going to go and and learn how to how to do lighting design, do you think that like a university program is the better way to go, or do you think it's better to go out? get some experience and then like go back to university after you kind of like understand where the where the industry is and what what's sort of going on right now. Hmm. That's an interesting interesting question. I mean I, I look I've never had a client ask me for any sort of qualification that I may have done or, you know, what are my credentials because um I guess fortunately I come from a time where um, you know, we, we, everything was based on experience. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a massive believer and there is no substitute for experience. Um, and like I said before, if you go into an institution and you get taught something, it's from a particular point of view. Um, we're incredibly lucky in Australia uh, and New Zealand uh, and most of Asia that um, probably to a slightly lesser degree, that we tend not to get pigeonholed into a particular genre so much. Like I'm, I feel like I'm incredibly lucky to be allowed to work in opera and work in broadcast and work in the corporate world. And so by being able to genre hop means that you know I can grab a whole lot of experience um, from those different genres and pull them together. If once you learn at, at a particular institution, um, and it's skewed a particular way, then you come out in that way. So if you if you um, if you come out of an institution that's focused on theatre, then you don't have any experience in broadcast. You don't have any experience in corporate. You're trying to use those values and those workflows in different genres that might not be applicable. So um, whilst formal learning, I think, is great. I think the, the, the first thing when you come out of one of those institutions that you need to do, um, and it's easier said than done, is to think, okay, great, I've learned that, now I need to learn the rest. Um, and the learning never stops. You know, I, I, I never stop learning, still and researching and looking at things every day. Um, but yeah, I think coming out of an institution, you definitely need to readjust and think, okay, I've learned an aspect of this greater industry. Now, what else is there to learn? Unless you want to stay in that particular genre or thing. Uh, uh, we talked about this the other day. Uh, time code. Um, where is it useful? Where is it not? And and how do you how do you use it in your shows? Time code is the best thing ever, um, but it does have its limitations. Time code. Um, for those who don't quite know what it is, it's basically it's another clock um, that's synchronized that is generally played from the same source that any music is played from. Um, so it works great on uh, any show where there's an audio department that are pushing play on a track. Uh, and then that separate track can come into your lighting and video control systems and automatically trigger cues. Um, now the great thing about that is that it gives you a reliable point in time that you can trigger a cue with a video cue uh, and, a, and a, a, a firework cue or an automation cue and it really synchronizes everything together. Um, it, it, it's something that is very simple. Time code's been around for 50 years. It was originally invented to keep pictures and audio synchronized in a movie cinema uh, environment. Um, but it's, it's invaluable when we talk about doing uh, public ceremonies like an Olympic or a Commonwealth Games ceremony uh, or any sort of TV show where there's any sort of performance involved or a trade show where there's a, a music track which has an audio and lighting organisation. Um, uh, yeah, the time code's incredible and I would, I would think anybody who wants to, to branch out into well, not even branch out, but anybody who's into lighting really should be understanding time code uh, and its nuances uh, so that you can apply it wherever you can. Um, do you, uh, just putting a couple together, do you get uh, nostalgic for certain fixtures, like fixtures that are no longer in use that 
that you would love to see. Like for me, I love the Mole 4K. I think it's awesome, but you can't get them anymore. But you know, are there those pictures out there for you? Oh, there are. You know, like there's nothing better than a VO5. You know, that, like that was the coolest thing ever. And um, but those things don't exist anymore. Um, oh, they do. Well, they do. They do. You know, and the VO5 <laughs> is not a VO5. Um, yeah. But, uh, and you know, I, 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 again, not because this is a Martin or Harman platform, but um, the very first moving light that I used was an old uh, scanner, RoboScan 1004, um, with a horrible, horrible little panel controller um, that I could never properly use. Um, but, you know, that, that was the first moving light I, I ever used, and I definitely romanticised about those little bit. Mac 500s and 600s were the first moving lights that I was really uh, allowed to use. You know, I wasn't in the very light club, so I, you know, I remember trying to talk to a local uh, very light uh, lease in Australia about getting some data on their fixtures in case I wanted to use them once, and they basically laughed at me and told me that I was never going to get my hands on it. Um, so the first nodding buckets that I really uh, had the chance to use were the Mac 500, 600s. Um, so you know, yeah, there are definitely uh, some fixtures that you look back at and romanticise about, and they're probably nowhere near as cool as they are um, yeah. in retrospect. Um, but you know, yeah, you know, any tungsten source, I kind of love tungsten as a source, and there are so many different. Variants on different tungsten fixtures that have a have a sort of uh, you know a texture and a feel to them that that modern fixtures just don't have and maybe one day will but um, I don't think that's romanticising I think that's true you know I think LED to tungsten is what CDs were to vinyl um, except you know probably LED has more positive um, had more positive aspects than maybe CD did to vinyl. Oh, cool. Uh, I think for the last question, is there anything that that you want to talk about before we uh, before we close it up? I don't know. I, I just noticed that I had this little slide here that um, that that are two that there are two things that I stumbled across. Well, the Henry Ford one for ages, um, but the other one is is what being a lighting designer means. And I'll start with that because. I probably should have referenced this when you asked the question, but I've often, I, I, people ask, what, what do you do? And it's like, yeah, well, where do I start? Turn the lights on and off? Um, you know, but the, the, the role of a lighting designer is so expansive. You know, you, you need to understand CAD um, and, and, and how to integrate your design onto a drawing into a greater show. You, of course, need to understand light, uh, Reflection, refraction, color temperature, intensity, balance, all of those things. Um, you need to understand video because as we've already said, video and lighting is incredibly ingrained in one another now. Um, sometimes you need to be a production designer. Sometimes you are being asked to provide the complete aesthetic um, and not just illuminate something, but you need to create the, the environment. You know, you need to understand networking so that you can get your protocols out to the world, even if you don't know it to a to a to the nth degree you just need to understand how a network uh, how a lighting network particularly um, works you need to understand about lighting programming even if you're not behind a console you still need to understand how a programmer works so that you can you can properly communicate with somebody behind a board um, so that they can realize the vision um, and a software engineer is trying to get this program to talk to that program by this program and trigger that there's so much involved uh, in that. Um, you know, I'd add you need to, you know, you need to be a, uh, a barista, you need to be a, a nutritionist, you need to be a psychologist. There, there are so many things that being a lighting designer um, actually means that um, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a very narrow, um, you know, at least in my experience, it's not a very narrow um, path. And then my other one was um, the Henry Ford one because I, I I often say clients and and producers sometimes are the, are the worst communicators in the world um, because they're very good or people not so much clients but just generally people um, 
And and by that I need to give you an example. So if you know you say, oh, we need to open the window. And someone looks at you and says, okay, I'll open the window. And they open the window and then the wind blows, the paper gets blown everywhere. And uh, when you really look into the situation, what I really wanted was to cool down because I was hot. Now, the real solution to that problem was to turn the air conditioning on. Then we wouldn't have blown the paper all over the room. Um, but instead of communicating what my problem was, I communicated what I thought the solution was. Um, so when, particularly when I'm dealing with, with, with clients and producers and other creative people, Sometimes getting to the root of the problem is more important than understanding what they think the solution is. And that's why I love this Henry Ford quote, which is, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Now, for people who don't know who Henry Ford is, I'm all of a sudden thinking, um, he pretty much invented the motor car. Um, and um, he was asked once, you know, well, why did you invent the motor car? And, and his response was, Ask people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse because horses were all people knew of, knew about. Um, but what they really needed was a motor car. But their solution would have been, oh, just make the horses go faster, make them go for longer without drinking. Um, but truly revolutionised things. And I think that's an important when it comes to communication. Um, even you know, as a leader, as being part of a team, um, communicating the problem rather than what you think the solution is is incredibly important. Nice. No, I think that's uh, we're just about uh, twelve fifteen. So uh, I think that's that's wrapping it up, Laura. Uh, I think that I think was a good, I, a good point to end it on. <laughs> I yeah. liked your last. I like. <laughs> I like that one too. Definitely. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for doing this presentation. I think everybody had a really great time. Um, you can see that their contact information is up on the slide here. So if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to um, Mason's contact information is there. And I'm sure he could pass on any information that you're wanting to get to Paul as well. Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded. So if any of you wanted to watch the recording, that will be released in a few days. And all of the upcoming sessions for additional webinars are available on pro.harman.com. So thank you so much for everybody joining and um, have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. I just want to say thank you to everyone as well. Really appreciate uh, anybody logging on and watching. And thank you, Nathan and Laura, for having me along.